And now, a Thanksgiving moment. You know, this is the time of year when we realize what it is we have to be thankful for. Of course, I'm talking about Thanksgiving. I know, hang on a second. This is called suede, buddy, so you need to be careful with that lollipop. It's time to be with your kids and your nieces and nephews, and don't touch them. That's just gonna egg them on, that's just. It's time when I remember all the warmth and love of conversations, and uh, well, let's just. Guys, hey, guys, seriously. Why don't you Roll come on. help? Don't even. But I know that I remember growing up, you know what, this is not gonna work. Haley, I'm sorry, my back is killing me. This kid's about to break my knee off. This one is as ripe as it gets. We need some, a lot of wipes for that one. Well, that's right, and I remember the turkey and dressing, and uh, you bet there was some cranberry sauce if uh, Uncle Teddy had anything to do with it. And uh, Uncle Floyd, I, 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 I tell you what, Haley, can, you've got to get her out of here because uh, my headache is about to explode here. Um, hey, seriously, Daryl, how about helping out this year? Hey, I'll tell you what, why don't you go outside and wait for me? All right. And uh, I remember uh, sitting around and laughing as a family, and sweetie, I have got to have some room here to do this. I know, it. I t you know what, this is like a practical joke. This is terrible. Okay, I'm about to freak out here. Daryl, should we put you at the kids' table since you're helping about as much as they are, or? Hold on, hold on. No point, do not point at me. Do not point. So my hope is that you have a very blessed time and a relaxing Thanksgiving. Oh, good morning. So I thought we'd add a little bit of uh, lightheartedness uh, today with everything that's, that's happening. Uh, and going on, but I want to welcome our, our friends online and other parts in the building uh, as well. Thank you for uh, connecting with us uh, today. So what do you consider to be impossible? Now, I get it. Uh, there's probably the, with God, all things are possible. I, I get that, but what do you consider to be impossible? Like, for example, uh, physiologically, it is impossible to touch your nose with your elbow. You know what else, what else is impossible? For you not to try this once you find out that it's actually impossible. So sometime throughout the day, you're going to find yourself doing this right here just to see how well that could work. Now, here's what I consider to be impossible. Dunking a basketball is impossible. Now, in my younger days of, of playing basketball, I, I was tall enough and I could jump enough to where I could touch the rim, but I could never like get over to where I could actually dunk a basketball. So after a broken leg and knee surgery and different things like that, I'm going to go ahead and put that in the impossible camp. Also, have you seen that guy that does all the tightrope walking, like he walks over the Grand Canyon and, and different things like that? Now, I've never tried it, but I'm going to go ahead and put that in the realm of impossible for me. Now, I, I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's morning person. Maybe it's just simply as simple as that, or liking your job, or getting along with a sibling, or forgiving a parent, or, or whatever it might be. You consider that to be impossible. Here's what I consider to be impossible right now. Being thankful. Uh, honestly, with everything that is, is going on, I, I have a hard time finding that place of thankfulness. I just, some of you, or most of you probably know this, but I mean, over the last couple of weeks, I ended up spending large amount of my time at my house in a 10 by 10 bedroom quarantining from the rest of my family because I tested positive for COVID. And so as if it hasn't been a disruption enough, it really disrupted my life and it's given me a completely different perspective on things. But it's hard to walk through this season of, of a pandemic and, and everything and be thankful I think about our political climate here today. Really hard to be thankful. 
Uh, I'll go as far as to say, as I, as I look at our world right now, I, I just, I just kind of land here. There's no one winning in politics right now. There's no winners. We're all losers as, as everything is, is going on. It's just such a difficult time. And then we have lockdowns. We have lines to get into stores. And there's just, it's just such an odd sort of time. And, and then add to that, I just let me tell you a little bit about church right now. This is what is breaking my heart. More than any other time in my lifetime, the local church is divided in, in ways that I never would have imagined. And, and you know, the, the fact of the matter is people decide, well, I'm not going to go to this church because I don't like the preacher, I don't like the preaching, I don't like the doctrine, whatever it is. But there's something different going on right now that is heartbreaking. It's like, here's, here's reality. And, and when I say it's happening here at Valley View, it's happening in other churches in our community. I've talked to, to pastors in Texas and, and Ohio, Oklahoma, all throughout the United States. We're all dealing with the same thing, where like, we have people that have made a firm decision, I will never go to Valley View again because they wear masks. And then we have people who are saying, I will never go to Valley View again because they don't wear, or, you know, it's, it's just like crazy. You've got maskers and you've got kind of maskers and kind of not maskers and militantly anti-maskers. And, and we're deciding fellowship based on that. And it's political. I talked to a pastor this week. He was talking about the fact that if he talks about politics, people leave the church. If he doesn't talk about politics, people leave the church. And it's not about Jesus. And so for me, it's really hard to be thankful during a season that we are in. Yet, yet there's this little thing in the Bible. Heck, Paul, who was a servant of God, wrote a lot of what we call the New Testament, said this, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So basically what we find is really three short verses, but three simple commands, very direct commands, to, to rejoice always, to pray continually, and to give thanks in all circumstances. Now, when I read this, especially right now, it's as if the Apostle Paul has just said, Brandon, I need you to dunk a basketball because this is in the realm of impossible to me. It's impossible to, to, to give thanks. Yet when I think about what the, the church in Thessalonica was going through, it is amazing to me that Paul gave them such a direct command of rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Think about this. Think about a, a church that just kind of in general throughout the Roman Empire, they could have faced persecution at any given time, whether it be at the hands of the Romans, uh, hands uh, uh, of Jewish leaders. Uh, there might be division among families. Uh, there could have been physical harm as a result of, of following Jesus. Even as, as simple as this, and uh, to do business in the Roman world, you had to be part of trade guilds. It's almost like the Chamber of Commerce, right? You kind of had to be part of these organizations, but being part of the organization meant that you were required to adhere to certain business practices, that you were certain religious practices to be part of this, this trade guild, and then to follow Jesus meant you had to compromise your values and ethics. So many people chose not to be part of, of trade guilds. They lost their businesses as a result of, of following Jesus. And then we find out what, what we find out about Thessalonica, and, and that Paul and, and Barnabas nearly lost their life when they, they went in and started the church. And when the persecution got so bad and they had to escape Thessalonica and they went on to the next town, 
Uh, Jewish people from, from Thessalonica followed them and, and caused problems for them there. And then Paul wrote this as he was writing in the book of 1 Thessalonians. In the very first uh, chapter, he says that they welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering and that he brought the gospel to them in the face of strong opposition. This is what it says in chapter 2. And then, dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea, who, because of their belief in Christ Jesus, suffered from their own people, the Jews. For some of the Jews killed the prophets, and even some killed the Lord Jesus. Now they have persecuted us too. They failed to please God and work against all humanity. It's in this context that Paul tells this church to rejoice always. Now, again, this feels impossible to me, to, to rejoice always. And, and I think we could be, uh, there's probably a, a dilemma of what does our rejoicing, so what is it supposed to look like? Because we've all probably been around that person. You know what I'm talking about with that person? That it seems forced, that, that it seems manufactured when they're rejoicing. Like, oh, God's great. Ah! You know, and it's like, it got up to something big. You know, I'm going to tell you. That to me does not feel like rejoicing. Like, let me just tell you. I, I had to, again, get the, the COVID-19 test. And then I had to wait for like five days to get the results and so on. Pretty much knew that I had, you know, the body aches and the cough and different things like that going on in my body and I've been exposed. So I was, I was connecting to us that I probably had it. And then um, I, I keep my phone beside my bed uh, and, and so on and usually don't check it at night. But I knew that I was expecting a, a test result, and it would go to the app on my phone because we live in that world. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, I, I look at my phone, and it says, you have a message from, you know, or whatever, Presbyterian and so on like that. And, uh, and so I, I get onto my, my chart and, and so on like that, and, and I get to my test results, and it says, you know, it's been, COVID has been detected and different things like that. I didn't rejoice. I wasn't like, praise God, but it says rejoice always. Now, it encompasses every situation. Honestly, it was not a place of rejoicing for me. In fact, I'm worst case scenario guy. And, and actually, by the time I got my test results, the worst was actually behind me. I was feeling good. I was ready to get back to work and so on. But the, 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 just the, the way things go in my mind, there was no rejoicing. There was playing out every worst case scenario that could possibly be played out in the world that we are in. And so it would have been forced, it would have been manufactured, it would have been a lie if I would have just dropped to my knees and said, Jesus, thank you for this. But here's the reality there can be another kind of rejoicing that doesn't freak people out. There can be another kind of rejoicing that just, that. It doesn't make it to where it's like, ooh, you've all been around that guy, right? It's like, it's just not real. How about that there can be a deep-seated contentment? In fact, in the business world, we would call this a non-anxious presence, this, this calm demeanor, this peace about us, that regardless of the circumstance, we can rejoice internally because we realize God's not done that he's actively moving, and sometimes he's actively moving in the worst of circumstances. Consider what Jesus' brother, Jesus' brother, his name was James, and he wrote a letter to the church. He wrote this in chapter 1 of James. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be uh, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, we can rejoice always. 
We can rejoice always, even in imperfect circumstances, even in in, imperfect situations, because God develops character through difficult times. Now, we don't have to thank God that we're walking through that difficult time except to acknowledge and realize that God can move in that. So let me ask a couple of questions. And these questions are really meant for us to think and to consider and and really kind of process things in our mind. What if, instead of complaining through the pandemic, now, as I say this, we've all complained through the pandemic, have we not? What if instead of complaining through the pandemic, we look for ways that God is deepening and developing our character through it? Again, that's a hard thing to do. That seems like an impossible thing to do. It may be an impossible thing to, to really do as we're walking through this, except to acknowledge that there's truth in Scripture that says God develops people through difficult times. We're walking through a very difficult time. And what if we are missing the voice of God because we are complaining so much through it? Let's talk about politics for a second because we love to talk about politics in the church. Our political world is as crazy as I have ever seen it. What if instead of complaining through everything that is going on and trying to figure out everything that is going on, what if instead of that, we realize that God is calling the church to be a completely different and distinct voice, not being heard on the right or the left right now? And what if We are spending all of our time trying to espouse our opinion that we are failing to be the voice that God wants us to be right now. You see, we have to acknowledge that God might be up to something, and we can rejoice in that. I am of the opinion I'm of the opinion right now that if COVID went away tomorrow, let's just say God, worldwide, global miracle, went away tomorrow, church can go back the way it was nine, ten months ago or whatever it is. I believe our church is going to be 25 to 30% less than what it was. But I believe we will be a stronger church because of it. That God is working and He is refining and He is He is molding people through this. Now let's talk about another impossible. Let's look at verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Some of your Bibles might actually say, pray continually. Now, honestly, this one stops me in my tracks. This one stops me in my tracks. You want to know why it stops me in my tracks? Because I'm the type of person, I can read the Bible for five hours before I can pray for five minutes. Really, I, 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 that's just the way I am wired up. And, and so the idea of prayer is always a challenge in my life. But then you say, pray continually here. And, and then that just seems like an impossibility. And maybe you're right there with me. Maybe you've heard preachers say, we just need to be praying continually. And you're thinking, yeah, yeah, but. Because here's the reality. In life, there's things called jobs. And in life, there's things called family. And in life, there's things called distractions, which are always around us. And so it's it's impossible to spend all of our time in prayer. You know why they started monastic communities a couple hundred years after Jesus? is because people were beginning to feel that the distractions of the world were not allowing them to pray. So they developed these communities where people could go out there and live apart from the world. I don't believe God wants us to live apart from the world. And so we have to deal with distractions. It was Martin Luther who said that 
It's amazing how many windows I have to shut in order to go to God in, in prayer. He even talked about the, the straw underneath his knees became a distraction. Yet there's pray continually. Now, I actually did a little word study. I like to do this word study on the, the original word for prayer in the Bible or in the New Testament. And, and, and this, is, uh, this is what I like about this, because it's a root of, of two words. It, it literally means to face in a direction and speak out loud. To face in a direction and speak out loud. Now, that was good for me. To, to face in a direction and speak out loud. So, prayer ultimately becomes turning my heart in the direction of God and speaking to Him about what's on my heart and mind. And I can do this all day, any day, any time of the day, any time I want. I can turn my, my direction and focus to God and speak to Him about what, whatever. Let me tell you, I, this kind of helped me figure it out, and this is not original with me, but I'm going to make it my own here. But on December 19th, 1992, Tara and I were on a stage at a church, standing before a pastor, and we exchanged wedding vows. And as we exchanged wedding vows, I can tell you that was a, a, a beginning of a journey together. Now, I love to be around my wife. Now, not everybody can say that. I love to be around my wife. I love to go out on dates with her. I love to take trips with just, just her and I. We laugh. We have a great relationship. She's my best friend, so on like that. So my, my desire would always be with her. But there again, there's a little thing called a job. And, you know, our cars like gas and mortgage people want to be paid and different things. So reality is I've got to live life. And so I do life and I do ministry and I do much of my life apart from her. But let me tell you one of the things that I'll do. Like when I get here to the church in the morning, I did it this morning. I do that almost every morning that I'm not at the house. See, I'm a morning person, so I get around a whole long, a lot uh, sooner than she does, so I will text her. And I'll text her, good morning, hope you slept well, hope you feel well, love you, text when you're up, something like that every single morning. Throughout the day, if I know she's up and around and feeling good, I'll give her a call and say, hey, how are you doing? And we'll have a quick chat. Now, Tara is the type of person that loves alone time. She loves alone time. And, and so even sometimes when we're at the house, she'll just say, I just need to go around and uh, go back to the bedroom and not be around people. And so she, that charges her batteries and, and different things like that. You know what she loves? She loves it when she's back getting alone time, being charged up, being by herself for me to go back to our bedroom and say, hey, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? I'm fine. Leave me alone. Okay, but I, I just wonder, what if prayer was like that? What if prayer was like that, that throughout the day, throughout the moments, throughout just kind of the humdrum of life, we turned toward God and spoke to Him? And what if we turned to God and spoke to Him to say, God, speak to us? And then there's another impossible here. Verse 18 Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks in all circumstances. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the word all. If you go to the original language, it's the word pan. It's where we would get the whole idea of panoramic. So if you take a panoramic picture, what you're trying to do is include all of everything that you see. So we are to, to thank God in all circumstances, every circumstance, not just good ones, not just the, the great ones, but we are to, uh, to, to thank God in every circumstance. Now, how many of you find that really, really hard? How many of you find it really, really hard to thank God in, in every circumstance? Let me just share a story with you it's a story about Corey Ten Boom. Now, if you don't know who Corey Ten Boom is, 
uh, she wrote the book called The Hiding Place, and it chronicles her time at Ravensbrück concentration camp during World War II. She was under oppression. She was part of, of uh, the, the Holocaust, which let's just call this one of the greatest genocides, if not the greatest genocide against a group of people in the history of history. This was vile, and it was putrid. And she and her sister Betsy, who were followers of Jesus, were in a, a, a dorm relegated for females at this concentration camp. Now, as, as things kind of came about, they were able to acquire a Bible, and they studied the Bible, they read the Bible, they prayed together every single day. And it perplexed them that they were able to go about with relative freedom in, in, in worship of Jesus in a Nazi concentration camp. But then one day, word kind of came to them, the reason why guards never came into the, the, the dormitory. They didn't darken, they didn't, they didn't do any kind of investigating, they didn't do any kind of check, it, they just simply stayed away. And the reason why the guards stayed away is because there was a flea infestation in this dormitory. And because of fleas, they, they were able to worship God freely in a, in a, in a time of, of oppression. And so they began to thank God for the fleas. Now, if they can thank God for fleas, maybe there's some items in our life that we need to be thanking God for, or even thanking God for the fact that He might be in this. Let me uh, share something. This kind of came up in a blog that I was reading the other day, and this hit home. I want to tell us why we can be thankful in all circumstances. We can be thankful in all circumstances because God is present in our circumstances. If He's omnipresent, we know that He is present with what we're going through. In Acts chapter 16, there's a story about Paul and Silas who were in prison, and they were singing hymns in prison because they believed God was there. And as they were singing these, these hymns, it says that there was an earthquake, and all the doors of the jail uh, sprung open, and the jailer was about to commit suicide because if a prisoner escapes, his life is on the line. And so he was thinking, I'm going to be executed and Paul and Silas, they, they yelled out, said, don't do anything. No one has escaped. And no one escaped. And they were able to share the gospel with him. And that night, he and his entire family were baptized into Jesus. You see, we can thank God in all circumstances, but the reality is there is no circumstance that God can't use. Really? I can't tell you how many times I have had somebody say, as I look back, that moment, and they, they're talking about that, that horrible moment, that marriage problem, that financial problem, the job loss, the, the health issue, whatever it may be, they, they look back at that and say, that ended up being the greatest blessing that has ever happened in my life. It's hard to see that as we're walking through it. But there is no situation or circumstance that God can't use. doesn't mean He will, but it's within the realm of possibility that He can. Also, God's wisdom is greater than ours. God's wisdom is, is so much greater than ours. And I think Jim said this one time, that you would make the exact decision that God makes if you knew what God knows. See, his wisdom is so incredibly vast. And let me just share something with you. It's happened uh, back in the late 90s and then bringing on to 2001. But 1997, Tara and I moved to DeKalb, Missouri, which is a little bit north of Kansas City. And we... Um, we, I'd just gotten out of grad school, different things like that, kind of first church type experience. But, you know, you always go into something thinking I'm going to be here forever. And 
about a year, year and a half in, we were like, probably even before then, it's like, this is not our forever place to be. And so I started looking for churches. And remarkably, I can tell you how many churches I talked to, how many churches I interviewed with. And it always came down to me and another guy, and the other guy always got, got the job. And I was like starting to really question God and question God's timing and why is this taking so long? And, and in 2001, uh, we, uh, we had our, our third child. His name is Joel. But on May 13, 2001, uh, it, was, uh, it was Sunday. It was actually Mother's Day. And we went to the hospital. They delivered Joel via C-section. Within two hours of, of delivering him, he was on an $11,000 helicopter ride to Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. Uh, they had to lifeline him there. By the time he got to Kansas City, one of his lungs had collapsed. Uh, he was un, not able to breathe on his own. He was on a ventilator, different things like that. Spent three weeks in NICU. Now, I will tell you that one day as the lead doctor, this was a teaching hospital, as the lead doctor was, was walking away, I said to a nurse, I said, if that doctor is paid a million dollars a year, he is underpaid. And she kind of, huh, a uh, million dollars a year, like that's like chump change to him. She goes, you don't realize the doctor that you have. She's, the, 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 the stuff that Joel's dealing with, the lung issues, the pulmonary issues that, that he, he has in his body, Dr. Trogue is the lead specialist in the nation with what Joel is dealing with. In fact, the, 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 the procedure that they're using, which was called a high-frequency ventilator, he came up with this. And then a few months later, we moved to New Mexico. And I look back, I wouldn't, I was, as I was going through it, I was like, this is, this is what God's up to. But as I look back now, I said, God's wisdom, God's timing, God in this was so much better than what I could do on my own. So listen, I can't explain everything that's going on right now. I'm not even going to try to. In fact, probably the best thing I can do with everything that's going on right now is say, God's not done, but I can't explain anything. But I can't explain this, and this is our bottom line. We've been invited to do the impossible because God's in the impossible. We've been invited to rejoice always because God is in every circumstance and situation. We've been invited to be thankful in all circumstances because God can work through any circumstance. So how do I own this? One is this, and this is real practical, and I've been trying to do this over the last couple of days. It's not the easiest thing to do, so I'm just going to challenge you to do this. Take 10 minutes every day this week, get a journal, get a note on your phone, and just look for ways for you can be, that, that you can be thankful Look for reasons for you to, to, be, to be thankful. And uh, I was actually talking with Jim last week, and uh, I'm not thankful that I got COVID. I'm thankful I had a very mild case. And, and I'm thankful that I have a, a different perspective on things that I didn't have three or four weeks ago. Also, I, I'm going to say it this way, and if you're a parent, you may have said this, or maybe your parents said this to you. Quit your belly aching. Paul said it a little bit better than that. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and per perverse people. Do you realize that the one way that we might stand out right now among everyone in the world is that if we don't grumble and complain when everyone else is? <laughs> but instead, we are thankful for what God might be up to. Will you join me in prayer? Father God in heaven, thank you. Thank you for tough times. 
Thank you for the things that we don't understand, but you have perfect understanding. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.